Hey everybody, welcome back to the next lecture. Let's get started with a multiple choice question. As always, hit that pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. So the correct answer here is B. So let's talk about panic disorder. Very, very common, therefore very high yield and important. So what is it? Well, this is a condition characterized by recurring panic attacks that are accompanied by intense fear and discomfort. Now the attacks typically peak around 10 minutes time and they're characterized by the presence of four or more of the following signs and symptoms. We have palpitations, we have paresthesias, nausea, lightheadedness, depersonalization or derealization, abdominal pain, chest pain, a fear of losing control, chills, choking, sweating, tremors, and shortness of breath. Now, in order to diagnose panic disorder, you need to see the presence of attacks followed by at least one month of demonstrating one of the following features. Number one, a persistent concern about having more attacks, or two, worrying about the consequences of the attacks, or three, changes in behavior related to trying to avoid future chat attacks. So changes in the way you behave with the goal of, let's say, preventing another attack from happening, even though in reality, you can't really do that because you probably don't know what caused it in the first place. So it's important to realize that the symptoms experienced by the patient, these are a manifestation of their fear of experiencing more episodes. So when you've had an attack and you're always worried, you're experiencing palpitations in the future, you're just paranoid, you're anxious, it's because you fear that it'll happen again. And so that's really important to remember that the actual problem moving forward is that physical manifestation of the psychological fear. Now, when it comes to treatment, what are our first line medications? Well, we can use SSRIs. We can also use venlafaxine. And of course, in addition to these, either or, uh, we should implement cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, if asked what you can give the patient acutely to minimize their symptoms, what class of medication do you think we could use? Benzos. Now typically, you're only gonna give benzos if you really think the patient needs it. They're very addictive. Um, and so trying to avoid giving them in the first place is ideal, but that's one of those things where you're gonna have to use your own professional discretion and uh, sort of you know see if you think they're warranted. And if they are, go for it. On your step one exam, on your CK, on your step three, Always try to avoid giving drugs that are highly addictive, like benzos, um, especially since they're typically never going to be your first line uh, treatment course, okay? Just something to keep in mind. All right, let's move on to the next question. Multiple choice here for you, so go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, guys, the correct answer here is D, at least six months. So a specific phobia is unique in that the patient has a phobia to a very specific object or situation. And in order to make this diagnosis, you need to see that fear for at least six months or more. Now, one of the keys to diagnosis here is that the patient typically realizes that their fear is excessive and that it's unwarranted and just might be silly. But even though they know this, there's nothing they can do about it. And that's what makes this a disorder. That's what makes this something that needs treatment. So what are we going to do to treat this patient? We're going to help them with cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure therapy. Now remember, something known as agoraphobia is a fear or anxiety about specific situations. But agoraphobia is about two or more specific situations. And that's an important point that can help you Remember the differences between agoraphobia and specific phobia, as well as help you differentiate between the two. Really important to keep that in mind. Now, on the opposite end of this, we've got a condition known as generalized anxiety disorder. This is basically an excessive state of worry or anxiety for most days, for six months or more. But as opposed to the specific phobia, the anxiety and the worry associated with GAD is about a variety of different things. So like family, school, work, uh, you know, the state of the country, whatever it may be. That's really the, the way by which you're going to recognize GAD is that there's, it's general. There's just, there's just a worry about everything. And, you know, some people 
who are worried about a little bit of everything might not feel like they have a condition, but when it starts to manifest in ways that you know hurts them on a day-to-day basis, their functionality, um, then we know we have a problem that we need to deal with. Now, GAD is also associated with additional factors um, that can be disruptive to the patient's quality of life. You can see fatigue. Like I said, the fear and the worry of ev- about everything can manifest itself physically. So fatigue. Muscle tension, uh, difficulty concentrating, restlessness, uh, disturbed sleep, as well as irritability. Now, of these additional factors, a diagnosis of GAD is strongly supported when you have at least three of those findings. So let me just say it one more time. Fatigue, muscle tension, uh, difficulty concentrating, restlessness, sleep disturbances, and irritability. So you've got, I think, six or seven things there. You wanna see at least three of those. Now, if we've identified that we think our patient has GAD, what are we going to do to treat it? Well, first line, we can use either an SSRI, uh, an SNRI, and you should implement uh, cognitive behavioral therapy along with that. Now, a lot of doctors don't do that, but as far as your exams go, you definitely should. Now, second line options include busperone, can use TCAs, can use benzos. You don't wanna use TCAs if you don't have to, just like you don't wanna use MAOIs if you don't have to. Busperone is typically a fairly safe um, and it has you know good effects. However, uh, it's just not first line because the other drugs are equally as effective and very well tolerated. Now, one last thing here. Don't confuse GAD with social anxiety disorder because social anxiety disorder is specific to social situations with public speaking actually being one of the most common types of social anxiety. Now, remember, GAD is about everything. Social is about social situations. Now, oftentimes, People need to give speeches. People need to present things if for their jobs, for whatever it may be, that they can't get out of. If this was the case, what class of medication do you think we could give in order to help calm their nerves, in order to prevent any sort of tremors or, or anything like that? What do you think we can give? Beta blockers are actually the ideal drug in this situation because if you got someone who needs to give a speech and they're just deathly afraid, this can calm them significantly and with very minimal side effects as well. Now, you could also use benzos, but remember, benzos are highly addictive and they're sedating too. And if you need someone who is up there active and energetic, giving something that's gonna calm them down to the point where they don't even care, uh, it's probably not your best bet. So as always, never choose benzos as the first line, right? It's counterproductive. Now, social anxiety disorder on its own, because what I was talking about just here is for that specific situation, social anxiety disorder can be managed with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, with SSRIs, and or with venlafaxine. Okay, all right, let's move on to the next question. We've got another multiple choice here. Go ahead and hit that pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. Correct answer here is C, Tourette syndrome. So obsessive compulsive disorder is different from obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes, uh, actually probably in the next lecture, but we will get to that when we talk personality disorders. Remember that in OCD, obsessions lead to distress. And as a means for minimizing that distress, what do patients do? They perform these repetitive actions. These are known as compulsions. So whether it's tapping something, whether it's counting, uh, counting bricks on the ceiling or tiles on the ceiling or turning a knob multiple times or just doing weird things, this is a way to minimize stressors that they are feeling. Now, while these do uh, relieve that stress in the moment, it's temporary. This is not a permanent fix. That's why they do it again and again and again. And that just, it's this vicious cycle and it makes the problem even worse. Okay, now this condition, OCD, we, we call this ego dystonic. This means that the behaviors that this patient is demonstrating are inconsistent with their beliefs and their attitudes. This is really important because this can help you differentiate between the OCD personality disorder, again, we'll talk about that shortly, that is egocentonic, meaning that it does uh, or it is consistent with the patient's beliefs and attitudes. So let me just say that one more time. The OCD disorder is ego dystonic. It is inconsistent with the patient's beliefs and attitudes. 
OCD personality disorder, which is characterized, of course, by you know excessive need for cleanliness, uh, for control, things like that. This is egocentric, which means it does, uh, it is consistent with their beliefs and their attitudes, and oftentimes they don't think there's anything wrong. And so that's one of the key ways you can differentiate these two disorders that have been named the same thing. Uh, for some reason, I guess they couldn't come up with a different name, but it is what it is. Now, as this question here alludes to, this is associated with Tourette syndrome, which don't forget is associated with motor and vocal tics. Okay. And the last thing I want to talk about here is a condition known as trichotillomania. This is a compulsion to pull out one's own hair. Now, typically it's going to happen on the head, but it can be anywhere on the body. Now, it, this is easily recognized because you will see areas of balding uh, or thinning, like I said, mainly on the on the head. Another thing you might see is hairs that are of different lengths. So if you've got a bunch of short hairs and then some long hairs, some medium hairs, then that might be a sign of trichotillomania. Now, as you might imagine, trichotillomania is highly distressing to the patient. And despite the fact that they want to stop, they can't. It's a compulsion. And so we need to manage this with psychotherapy. Now, as I said, although this is a compulsive disorder, trichotillomania itself, it's not associated with OCD. Just threw it in here because it is a compulsive disorder. Okay, let's do one more question and then we will take a short break. This is a multiple choice question. Go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. Correct answer here is A, generalized anxiety disorder, GAD. We just talked about this. And this is an example of the importance of knowing the time frames when it comes to diagnosing behavioral disorders on your USMLE exams. There is probably nothing as important if you want to do well in psych, uh, specifically pathology, um, to know those time frames because it, if you don't know them, you're guessing, honestly. Um, now, this sounds just like adjustment disorder, right? 100%. And if you got this right, awesome. If you didn't, then I want you to pay really close attention. Like I said, this sounds just like adjustment disorder. But if symptoms do not dissipate by six months after the stressor ends, then we move into GAD territory. And that means the GAD becomes the correct diagnosis in this case. So what is it about this that, that, that tells us the stressor is gone? Well. When I was creating this question, I thought I could leave her in school, but then the stressor's still there. So she quits, moves back home. That was a stressor, leaving home, going to the new school. Now she's back home, stressor's gone. The problem is still ongoing well over six months time. So please make sure you A, know the timeframes associated with all psych disorders, and B, pay very close attention to the vignette details so that you don't overlook something simple. Don't just see some buzzwords and say, oh, I know what it is. That is a surefire way to get caught up in the distractors, in, in what they're trying to trick you into selecting. Now, I'm not saying they're trying to trick you. I'm just saying there's information there that is attractive for every option, all right? Now, do you know a drug that is a partial 5-HT1A receptor agonist that is used in the treatment of GAD? I mentioned it a couple minutes ago. That would be buspirone. Now, busperone is a decent drug because it won't cause addiction, doesn't cause tolerance, or doesn't cause sedation either. Um, and another you know, beneficial thing about it is that it doesn't interact with alcohol. A lot of people drink when they are uh, feeling down or anxious, so that's really, really positive. Um, now, I'm not saying that's your number one, but I just wanted to point out the, the receptor that busperone acts on because I talked about it a couple minutes ago when I mentioned GAD. Now, Adjustment disorders, obviously, still very important to know. And remember that in order to diagnose adjustment disorder, there needs to be symptoms that start within three months of the onset of a stressor, and they need to dissipate within six months after that stressor has been eliminated, after it has ended. So look for symptoms of anxiety, anger, or outbursts as part of the way that this might present in your patient. But I want to also keep in mind, keep in mind that the symptoms don't meet criteria for MDD. So, you know, if you see signs and symptoms that are consistent with MDD, you might be dealing with MDD. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Okay, you want to see a few 
of these signs and symptoms, but not full-blown major depression. Now, just be very cautious with that. This is another you know, thing that can be tricky because as soon as students see, oh, there's a stressor, I'm thinking, um, I know exactly what it is. We're talking adjustment disorder. But then if the criteria aren't met, you don't want a diagnosis, okay? Now, we've made our diagnosis, let's say, of adjustment disorder, right? We've found the symptoms, we've seen all this. What is the first line treatment for adjustment disorder? We've made our diagnosis. What are we going to do? Medications? No. Actually, you're going to treat with cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, one last additional trauma-related disorder that commonly pops up on exam day is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a response to a life-threatening condition. Oftentimes, um, this is associated with war veterans, right? Being Coming back from war. Um, but it can be experienced by someone who sees something traumatic on the street or who is involved in some sort of traumatic event, like a, an accident or something like that. Ultimately, what you wanna look for in your vignette is a history of an extremely stressful situation that leads to symptoms for at least one month accompanied by functional impairment and significant distress. Now, in addition to that, I want you to watch for other symptoms, such as avoiding anything that's associated with, with the stimulus. So let's say there's a car accident you saw or you're involved in. You go out of your way to avoid that area, even if it means driving 10 miles out of the way. That would be uh, you know, something that tells you, hey, this person's going out of their way to avoid associated stimuli. Watch out for someone who tells you they have intrusive thoughts about the incident, so they can't stop thinking about it and it's driving them crazy. Watch for someone who's persistently hyper aroused, meaning they can't calm down. There's always like, you know, it's always on their mind and they're always sort of high strung. They can't calm down persistent hyperarousal. As well, you wanna look for changes in mood and or cognition, very commonly seen with PTSD. Now, one of the characteristic findings of PTSD is the presence of nightmares. And that is something that can really help you pinpoint and nail down this diagnosis of PTSD. And do you know which drug we can actually use to reduce the incidence of nightmares in a patient with PTSD? Most students don't guess this, but it's prazosin. Okay. Now, the way by which we are going to approach the management of PTSD is with cognitive behavioral therapy, SSRIs, and venlafaxine. Okay. Make sure you guys know the differences between all these uh, anxiety-type disorders. Super high yield can get confusing, as you know, I probably just made it for you. But just um, rewatch that last couple minutes there if you need an explanation to help you um, understand how to look at a vignette in psych to make sure that you don't just get pigeonholed into choosing the wrong answer. All right, we'll see you guys on the next lecture.